Dear Heavenly Father, you've brought us to this moment tonight to study this part of your word for some eternal good purpose. And we come tonight, Father, with that expectation on our hearts, confident and aware that you work in ways we can't begin to understand, that the details of things that are planned go so far beyond our understanding, our comprehension, Father, that that leaves us with no choice but to simply trust and to rely on your providence, your wisdom, your mercy and grace, and to come with an expectation that when we give time to you and to sit at the word, at your feet to hear the word, that there will be something in it for us. There will be something there that we would not have had otherwise, and, and that your blessing will be upon us for having given ourselves to your word. And we also know, Father, from experience that that blessing won't necessarily come from the things we learn on the pages before us today. It's not always the case, Father, that you spell it out in the first hearing. So often it's something we come to understand in a deeper way. It's it's some daily event in our life yet to happen that will put this knowledge in the right place at the right time. And so, Father, we come with that expectation. Teach us as only you can. Thank you, Lord, that we have people in here that are helping in so many ways for this conference that we're about to engage in. I pray, Lord, you'd be working through us as well to minister to so many who are coming, perhaps again, without an understanding of what they'll get or why even. But, Lord, you know. Let us be useful to you. Let our training and our edification tonight be part of that usefulness, Father. Let us be able to put to work what we learn. Help us to be more like you in what we know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So last week we ended our story in a humorous plight about the Philistines holding the ark and all the wonderful things God did to them because of their holding on to this deadly artifact. They came to possess it because they defeated Israel in battle, which itself was the Lord's doing and the way he turned Israel over to their enemies because of their sin. And once they brought that ark into their cities, the Philistines encountered these tumors and the death that followed. We'll talk more about that tonight. And then as they came to understand where the power for these things was coming from, well, as you remember, they shuffled the ark from city to city all the way through the towns of the Philistines. It was on that uh, Philistine tour, as I called it. And we observed last week that the Lord had permitted this entire sequence of events to happen because he wanted to make a point to both Israel's enemies and to Israel itself that the nation of Israel was largely apostate. As we know from the time of Judges, men were doing what was right in their own eyes which is a concise way of saying they didn't consult the Lord and they didn't consult his word. That's the people that Israel have become. And nothing exemplifies their selfish, self-centered heart better than the very concept that they would take the ark of God out of the tabernacle, put it into battle and think that it's going to magically lead to a victory in battle. Let's curry his favor by taking this box out and using it as a superstitious icon and expecting it to do all the great things we want, doing what was right in their own eyes. Remember, we said last week that while they're making all this up, this plan, where was Samuel? Samuel was in Shiloh, right where the ark was, speaking the word of the Lord. They only had to go to him to ask the very questions they were asking, but they ignore the word of the Lord and they go about doing it in their own power on this cockamamie plan that results in not only a huge devastating loss at the hands of the Philistines, but now the loss of the ark itself. So the Lord permitted all those outcomes to teach Israel a lesson about how you approach and how you serve the living God. But then we also saw the faithfulness of God in evident in the way he allowed the Philistines to capture the ark. But then we see God defending Israel himself in the process. So the Lord granted the enemies of Israel this great military victory. And arguably, they could have gone further from that point and conquered all of Israel next. What was going to stop them? But instead, the Lord displayed his power against them through the ark. And in effect, they became distracted with their own problems because of the ark and didn't turn their attention back to defeating Israel like they might have. This is a hidden form of grace for Israel in the way God was distracting their enemies, even in the midst of all of this apostasy. The lessons aren't over. So tonight we still have to find how the ark finds its way back into the hands of the Israelites. And ironically, the Lord is going to use the Philistines to demonstrate to Israel, the appropriate way you approach the ark. And then the Israelites are going to have to relearn where they go for the Lord's counsel and for his blessing, not in superstition and ritual, but according to his word. So we have to turn, if you will, the other side of this cycle to find how the Lord brings it all home for Israel. So we start in chapter six. This is the story of the ark's return. So we'll open there verses one through nine. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? 
Tell us how we shall send it to its place. They said, well, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, well, what shall be the guilt offering which we shall return to him? And they said, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you shall make likenesses of your tumors and likenesses of your mice that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you, your gods and your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had severely dealt with them, did they not allow the people to go and they departed? Now, therefore, take and prepare a new cart and two milch cows on which there has never been a yoke and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put the articles of gold, which you return to him as a guilt offering in a box by its side. Then send it away that it may go. Watch. If it goes up by the way of its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, well, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. Maybe one of the most interesting details, the one that you see right up front. It's been seven months, seven months of torment. Clearly, these people wanted this ark gone on day one, much less seven months later. So why are they waiting seven months to say, you know, maybe we should give this thing back. Well, first, start with the number itself. The number seven in Scripture is God's way of communicating completeness. Now, we use the expression 100 percent in order to express the idea of the whole of something, the completeness of something. Well, you and I use 100 percent. God uses seven. But those two numbers have equal meaning in that respect. So we see here that seven months has gone by before the ark is able to return to Israel. What you're seeing then in the number seven is God's hand at work here. God has held it in their hands for seven months so that it would have its intended effect upon them. And so that that number in itself would speak to us that this is God's purpose. It couldn't leave until God's purpose had been done. And the number seven reminds us that only now is it time for God to allow it to leave. So after seven months... The priests of Dagon and the diviners, or another word for that would be the cultic prophets, they're asked by their lords, how are you going to finally solve this problem? How do you get rid of the ark? How do we send it away? Now, here's another curious detail, because if you stop and you think about it for a minute, we realize this is saying something about the attitude of these pagans. Because why can't they just destroy the thing? Why don't they just sink it at sea? Why don't a bunch of men just pick the darn thing up, carry it back to Israel and dump it over the borderline? Why is this such an ordeal? To get it back. The answer is that these pagans have an instinctive understanding that gods don't work that way. The power of God extends well beyond the physical realm so that it's not merely an issue of where the ark is residing physically. The problem is the Philistines are facing a lord of this ark who's not pleased with them. So no matter what you do with the object, the bigger question is, what are you going to do with the God and his concerns? So one way or another, what the Philistines have got to do is figure out how do you appease the wrath of this God who is not happy with them, a God they don't know. They realize that just returning a wooden box isn't going to suffice. They have to divine. That's why we have these men now called to divine, that is, understand what is this God's will for us? How do we know what will make him happy? Here you see the pagans operating with a fear and an understanding of God's true power and divine authority, one that the Israelites themselves were not exhibiting. They are still pagans. I'm not suggesting otherwise. They still don't understand the true living God as the one and only God. That is obvious. But they still appreciate he has divine power and they're concerning themselves with it. In fact, we could say they're demonstrating more fear of the Lord than Israel did, which is the irony of this story. So how do these people decide they're going to appease the wrath of a God they don't know? How do you understand the desires of a God from whom you have no word? You have no counsel. You have no prophets. Where do you go to understand what he wants? That's why they're seeking to discern it in some other way through the advice of these priests. Now, notice the solution that the priests offer. It begins with, very importantly, an admission of guilt. The ark just can't be sent away on its own. Something of value must accompany the ark as a display of admission of sin and as a display of contrition. One theologian said, even the pagans understand you can't go before a God empty handed. And so there's this concept here that the people have to own up to what's created the wrath in the first place. How do you do that? 
Well, they have to have a payment. There has to be a payment for this sin in some form. In this case, they're working without the benefit of God's word, without the benefit of the law, which was given to Israel alone at this time in history. So you have to improvise. You have to come up with some way to read the tea leaves, as we might say. So they propose this solution. They say, look, this ark is going to be sent away with 10 golden objects, objects made of solid gold. They arrive at the number 10 by taking the five Philistine cities, which each had its own lord, the five lords. And then they create two objects for each of these cities. And the objects are, as you heard, tumors and mice. And before we look at those for a minute, just look at the gold itself for a second. Let's assume these objects are reasonably substantial in size. So we're not talking about like a ring sized gold object, right? We're talking about something you could hold in maybe one or two hands, let's say. If you just did some rough estimates and you'd make up your own numbers, of course, we're all just guessing here. But it's somewhere of, let's say, a million dollars worth of gold by weight if you did 10 objects of a size somewhere like this. Okay, that's that's a lot of money. That's the point, right? These objects demonstrate a certain degree of contrition which is consistent with the sacrifice that's required to give up that much value, right? It's, it's a trivial thing to give up something you don't care anything about, and God knows that as well as you do. When you give up something you care for, that heart attitude carries through, and that's what these pagans are trying to illustrate to God, a God they don't know. Hey, this is worth a lot. You see how guilty we feel. But now, why these objects? Why tumors? Well, tumors is probably the most obvious of the two because this is what they've suffered from. This is a plague of deadly tumors, so they offer something that is constructed in a form that memorializes God's work. And that's another quality to a good sacrifice. In other words, it's connected to the lesson God is teaching so that it emphasizes, I got the lesson. I understand what you're asking here. And they're saying, we got it. Tumors was our fault. Bad on us. Here's some tumors to make sure you get the point that we know. But the mice, why the mice? Well, the mice is sort of an odd choice, but it does suggest a logical connection. And here's another theory for what the tumors were about. The earlier theory I gave you last week is connected to a certain Hebrew word that suggests the groin area. So we thought perhaps it meant tumors of like the hemorrhoid type. And that's possible. But if you throw the mice in here, you notice it says the mice are ravaging the land as well. It's not just the tumors going everywhere. There's mice everywhere. Well, mice, rodents in general, are often associated with bubonic plague. And it's really the fleas that are on the rodents that are the cause. And bubonic plague causes very large deadly tumors on people's bodies. So this offers a second possibility for what God actually brought upon the Philistines. It was bubonic plague, the Black Death. In any case, taken together, the ten golden objects are a testimony to the Lord's wrath brought against their people for their sin in taking the ark. In fact, the number ten in Scripture stands for testimony. Ten means testimony when it's used in that sense. So this is a clear sign testifying to the Lord's judgment against the Philistines' sin, that they're these ten objects of the guilt offering. Finally, as we think about the plan here, it's interesting that these pagans do not propose something which you might have otherwise expected a pagan to propose. They don't propose to make idols of God himself. When they considered the shape that these particular objects should take, no one suggested, well, they should be an homage to the God that now is mad with us. Make a picture of him. Well, why can't they do that? Well, they have no idea what he looks like. But it would have been a very pagan thing to do that, right? They had a, they had a version of Dagon set up in their temple, right? Pagans like to have pictures of what they worship. That's the whole idea. But now they choose other objects to honor the God of Israel. This was in keeping with God's law forbidding graven objects. Not that they knew the law necessarily, but it is in compliance with it, which is ironic when you consider how the people of God, who had the word of God, particularly the law, how did they treat the ark? They treated it as a graven object, dragging it into battle. So again, you have this irony between these pagans who know nothing, doing what God would prefer, given their options, and in contrast to that Israel, God's people not doing it. Paul says in Romans 2.14, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, These not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them, as Paul wrote. The point is, how do we explain these men having such great insight into what would please a God they have no concept of? Well, the only answer is God must be working in their hearts to reveal himself to the degree necessary to ensure these behaviors play out the right way. And what would God's purpose be in doing this? Well, none other than to create the contrast we're observing now in the text. Pagans who don't know you do the right thing. What does it say about God's people who did know but don't do the right thing? It's a doubly convicting comparison. 
Then in verse six, the priest says that this entire act of what they're about to do, this testimony would have to be to the glory of the Lord of Israel. That's exactly the purpose in this entire episode that we've been watching here, that the people of Israel had the ark originally by God's grace. The ark and the tabernacle and the entire nation of God were created to reflect glory on God, to be a light among the nations. Together, they were to testify to the truth. They did none of those things. So while Israel was neglecting the calling of God to be a testimony, what did God do? He took a people who did not know them, a people who had no interest in him, and he molds them for at least this moment into the testimony and into the example that his own people should have been in the first place. So God allowed the pagans of that land to take possession of his ark. And as they took possession of it, they become a testimony to his glory. Now, obviously, what's interesting here is the testimony came in the form of judgment, but nonetheless, it still came. So, friends, here's the lesson. You can choose to be a testimony of God in your obedience Or you can choose to be a testimony to God in your disobedience. But one way or another, you're going to glorify the Lord. In fact, the priests remind the people here that the Lord made an example of Egypt and he can do the same to us. (laughs) Do we want to be that kind of an example? Don't harden your hearts. Or as we like to say, sometimes you can you can honor God the easy way or the hard way. This is so ironic, as I keep saying, because earlier, if you remember, The Philistines expressed fear when they heard that the Israelites were bringing the ark into the camp right before the battle. What did they say? They said, oh, who can stand against this God? This is the God that destroyed Egypt. Remember that? Now, it turns out their words were prophetic, though they didn't realize it, because they are now comparing themselves to Egypt again. But now it's after the fact, after all of those plagues showed up. They should have been afraid of that ark in the first place. So now they have their plan. Their plan is to appease the Lord's wrath. And they're going to do it by giving him this guilt offering. But how are they going to know if God has been appeased? How are they going to know if the guilt offering is accepted by God? That's the last part of this equation you have to figure out. Well, that leads to this second part of the plan. They construct what is essentially an improbable set of circumstances that will, by the very nature of them, reveal the will of a sovereign and all-powerful God. They take two nursing cows. That's what my Bible says, milch. That's another word for nursing. They have two nursing cows. And these are cows that have never pulled an ox cart of any kind before. They weren't used in that fashion. So they have no familiarity with anything being put on their shoulders. Or Do cows have shoulders? They do now. And being made to pull anything, that's a totally new thing to them. And yet they're going to do that to them. They're going to yoke them to a cart. Then they're going to put the ark and the guilt offering on the cart. Then they're going to send it in the direction of Israel. And then the test is this. If the cows continue on their own into Israel with this cart, then they have to take that as a conclusion that the Lord himself, the God who is involved with this ark, has made that outcome happen. And therefore, he is pleased to let the ark leave the Philistines. If it returns, on the other hand, if it doesn't make its way to Israel, then they don't say that the Lord said anything. They just say we don't have an answer. It's by chance. And that's it's not to say that they believe there's God's power and chance. That's not exactly the sense of it in Hebrew. The sense is more of then we'll know God said yes versus we'll know nothing. We won't have an answer. Now, how can they be sure this represents God's will? Well, nursing cows, number one, don't voluntarily leave their young. But you notice they're going to take the the nursing calves away from the cows, take them home, they said, so that the cows are wondering what happened to my young. But they're going to be back where the cows normally nurse. And then secondly, you have cows that are yoked, as we said earlier, and they don't necessarily want to be yoked. They're not going to react positively to that experience. Usually they're going to want to not walk anywhere. They're going to like a bucking bronco. They're going to want to not have this on their backs. So if you would put all of that sort of stacking the deck here, if you stack the deck against them doing what you say they're going to do and then they still do it, what could explain overcoming all of that resistance? Well, it has to be God working his sovereign hand in the circumstances. So what the Philistines have done is they've demonstrated the need to display repentance and propitiation before God. And now they're testifying to their belief in his sovereignty to control all factors, all things. He can control everything and he can hear and watch and speak in return by how he orchestrates these circumstances. Now, again, they only see God in a limited way. They don't have you know, saving faith, but they are teaching Israel a thing or two here about how you approach the living God. So let's see how this plan plays out. You already know, I'm sure. But verse 10, then the men did so and took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. They put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the likenesses of their tumors. And the cows took the straight away in the direction of Beth Shemesh. They went along the highway, 
lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines followed them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they raised their eyes and saw the ark and were glad to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua, the Beshemite, and stood there where there was a large stone. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the larger stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned to Ekron that day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned for a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Goth, and one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both of fortified cities and of country villages. The large stone on which they set the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua, the best Shemite. So, as you heard, they hitch up the cows, send the babies home, put the ark on the cart. Everybody says, let's see what happens. And sure enough, in a true miracle, the cows leave Ekron. They go toward Israel. And even though they've never been harnessed before, they don't resist pulling. They don't go back to their calves. They don't turn left. They don't turn right. They just head straight for where they've been pointed without meandering. And then just to emphasize the fact that these cows are operating according to the Lord's will and not of their own will, you hear that they're lowing the whole way. Lowing is a protest. It's the sound a cow makes when it's not happy. These cows are very unhappy about leaving their calves. They're probably none too happy about carrying anything either. And the whole idea of what they're doing and where they're going is not to their liking whatsoever. It is not in their nature to do what they are doing right now. But why are they going? Because they are obeying their creator and they have no choice otherwise. These cows serve as a beautiful picture in that sense of every child of God. And no, I'm not calling you a cow. Because by our fallen nature, we are prone to go our own way and not to follow God. And so it's not in our nature to do what God would call us to do. Scripture says we are naturally inclined to serve our flesh rather than to follow the spirit. But when you hear the word of God and when you do it, you are demonstrating your love for Christ in your obedience. But when you obey God, there are going to be times in your life when you feel like lowing all the way. You feel scared. You feel uncomfortable. There's sacrifice involved. There's personal sacrifice involved. Inconvenience, to say the least. These are the natural consequences of going against the, both the flesh you have and the world around you. And as God calls you in his word to do these things and you obey, the sense that this is not a pleasant endeavor will often be accompanying your, your obedience. I think it's a bit naive, to say the least, to assume, much less teach others, that just because you obey God, everything is going to be roses and butterflies and hunky-dory. That's not my experience. There's goodness in doing what God calls you to do. No one's denying that. But to say that your personal experience in the obedience will always be fun and happy uh, sets up, I think, young Christians for an unrealistic expectation that ultimately may give them cause to think, well, I must be doing something wrong when I obey God's word because it's not all happy like I was told it would be. Right? These cows are not happy, right? But God's word never says that serving the living God will be painless or trouble free. But that's not the criteria for what is good or what is best for us. You go forward with a heart of service because that's what obedience requires. That's what faith expects. And ultimately, there will be goodness in obedience. I'm not saying there won't be. I'm saying that it may not be immediately evident to us. And it's almost always accompanied by some kind of sacrifice. So the cows head straight for Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh is a small village about 15 miles west of Jerusalem. There's virtually nothing there now. It, it was ruined. It was destroyed in about uh, 1200 B.C. It was the closest Jewish town to the Ark's last stop on its Philistine tour at Ekron. So this is literally the closest place you could send it if you wanted to get it out of Philistine territory and into Jewish territory. The name Beth Shemesh means house of the sun. And under the Canaanites, it probably had a temple to the Canaanite sun god. That's probably where its name came from. By this point, it's inhabited by the Israelites. As the ark makes its way from Ekron to this city, it's about a seven-mile journey from a valley up through a hill country to a high point. So this is an uphill walk for these cows. It passes through the Sorek Valley, which was the home of Samson, who was the judge of Israel ruling at this time. So it goes through Samson's hometown. 
Likely the ark passed by a lot of villagers who were working in their fields. We hear about the ones in Beth Shemesh who saw it, but they're probably not the first ones to see it. Even if it was just someone who was walking on the same road, they probably encountered it. Can you imagine the scene? Here comes a couple of cows pulling the ark of God right behind me with no one with it. Why didn't someone claim it? Why didn't someone say, hey, guys, look what I found. How did this get so far seven miles by two cows pulling it very slowly? How do you get it seven miles with no one touching it? Well, the answer, if that happened, I'm speculating all about this, but if it did happen that way, then the answer would have to be that under the Mosaic law, only the priests were permitted to handle the Ark of the Covenant. If you're not a priest, you're not going near that thing because Numbers says you'll die if you touch it. And even then, the priests themselves were required to carry it in a very special way, putting wooden poles through those those rings that are on the sides, lifting it by the poles, not touching the actual object. So without anyone able to touch it, the ark is moving in this little solitary parade down the road, everybody keeping their distance, too afraid to interrupt its journey if any saw it. So why is Beth Shemesh able to receive it? Well, interestingly, in this day, Beth Shemesh is a Levitical city. That means the town is full of Levites, people who are qualified to handle the ark and bring it back to its proper place. The first Levite to see the ark in the town is a man named Joshua. Notice how it reached him. We're told that the cows pull it until they reach a large stone. Then they stopped. So they are, as it were, directed by God to come to this rock in this man's property. Now, why is this the place God puts the ark? Well, the first thing to notice is the man's name. Joshua. That name in Hebrew is Yeshua. The same name as our Messiah. So we could say the ark is claimed by a priest named Yeshua. So his first thought is to notice that this ark has been stopped on his land next to this giant stone. And he decides to give thanks to the Lord for returning the ark. And in God's providence, look what he finds there waiting for him. He has everything required for the sacrifice. The ark came, of course, and it was brought by cows who were sacrificed Grateful thanks from a nation who appreciated their service. And then the ark came on a cart, which was wood, which became the source of the fire, as you heard. And guess where it stops? Right next to a large stone uncut by human hands, which is the law's requirement for an altar. In other words, God gave his people the ark, the sacrifice, the wood and the altar. And he provided a priest named Yeshua to administer the ceremony, to intercede, as it were. Can you see the message that's being embedded in this moment? What has Israel done to warrant the return of their precious ark? Did they repent first? Did they sacrifice first? No, there's no evidence that they've taken even a single step toward becoming more godly than they were before the whole thing transpired. But what happens? After seven months, there's that number again, the Lord returns his ark to his people. He returns it as a matter of grace since he made these cows walk where they did. He returns it without any human work whatsoever. Even the process of moving the ark was not done by human hands. God gave everything required for the restoration of fellowship. He provided a man qualified to officiate at the altar. It was grace and grace alone that made this restoration possible. And God did all the work and made all the sacrifice and provided all the material. A beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So you find... Christ at the center of it, as pictured by this man with the same name and all the ingredients that describe the gospel, not by works, but by faith. I will provide a sacrifice, as Abraham says to his son, the Lord will provide the sacrifice, etc. So with the ark, with the guilt offering, with the altar, that is the rock, the Levites then can officiate over this sacrifice and this thanks to the Lord. But that's not all that's going on on this day. Look at verse 19. He struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck down of all the people, 50,070 men. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadad on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. From that day, the ark remained at Kiriath Jerim. The time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. 
So it's not all happiness on this day. Apparently, as you can tell from the text, at some point during what the priests were doing with the sacrifice and all the rest, some of the priests decided to check out what was on the inside of the box. You know, let's just make sure everything's there. Let's, you know, maybe they took something. Let's check on it real quick. And they look. Now, no one is permitted to ever look inside the ark according to Numbers 4, verse 5. No one, not even the priests. So they were given custody of the ark because that's their role, but they were the quickest to violate the very law they're supposed to oversee. And so they look into this ark. Here's further evidence that the hearts of the people of Israel, including the priests, are still far from the Lord. They're not listening to his word at all. And their irreverent behavior still stands in stark contrast to what the pagans did. They were so fearful of this object that they had to work this special plan to get it home again. So if the Lord judges pagans in the way that he did for their disobedience, how do you think the Lord should respond to people who know better? Well, that's why you see the distinction between tumors and death. For the Philistines who did not have God's law, much less understand these details, God certainly made clear that they were making a mistake and repentance was the ultimate outcome, at least in some form, we can say. For the Israelites who should know better and had God's word and were put on notice and they do the wrong thing, then they pay the penalty of God's word. God is not going to be made a liar. His word said clearly what would happen and he executed that plan as he said he would. And he responds by putting to death 50,070 men. And that number is remarkable for two reasons, the size, the magnitude of it and the symbology of it. It is a sizable number, as you can tell. It must have been a most, if not Certainly not all, but it was most of the male Levites living in Beth Shemesh. We have to imagine the city isn't really that big to handle more people than that. And these are just men, so the families would have been there too. It's that extra 70, though, that's tacked on that's so interesting. 70. You know, it's a round number in its own right, 70 exactly. But why 70 on top of 50,000? It's there to make clear this is the work of the Lord in response to their sin. Now, you might have in some Bibles here a translation that reports a much smaller number than 50, uh, than 50,000. The textual support in the, in the original manuscripts favors the larger number by far, as does the people's response. Uh, if you have a relatively low number there, as some translations have inserted, you can't explain as easily why the crowd is so upset at the death. It is a huge number for that reason. To, to, it created such a shock. And what follows also is more logical, given a large number of deaths. Because in response to the deaths of so many, the remaining Levites were told lament what God has done. And then they ask this question. It's a rhetorical question. They say, who's able to stand before the Lord? This is a very interesting response, considering what's just happened. What they don't say is we have sinned. Uh, we have violated the law. Oops, I knew we shouldn't have done that. They don't have any sense of we contributed to this outcome at all. What they say is who can stand before the Lord. What that means literally is. No one can remain alive in the face of such a fierce, unreasonable, unpredictable God. That's what that phrase means, essentially. You ever had a kid protest against your rules like nothing pleases you? No, a lot of things please me. Just not that is the way you would respond to that kind of child behavior. Well, this is what you're seeing here where they're saying, well, after you see what our Lord just did, no one can stand before this Lord. There's no hope to please him. He's so unreasonable. That's the implication. So in an ironic twist. They do very much the same thing that the pagans do. They call for a small neighboring town to accept the ark in place of them. So they're shuffling it off now. This little town is called Kiriath Jerim, which is another 10 miles east from where this city is. This is not a Levitical town. So there would have been no one in this town capable of handling the ark or moving it around. So instead, because they do want to get rid of it, they send it to a man named Abinadab. They give it to him, to his land, to a place where it can be housed on his property. And because he is not a priest and no one else around him is a priest, they say, well, bring your son out. And they consecrate his son and walk away. Basically, they deputize the guy and say, here, you can handle the Watch this for us, will you? Don't touch it. Basically, a corrupt, dysfunctional priesthood dumps the most precious object from the house of God in a random Jewish home and then runs away. If you remember the scene at the end of the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they roll the ark into that giant warehouse, that's what's happening right here. This is basically where that scene would have come from. This is the old version of it. And here it remained, and you notice the commentary from Samuel, and it was a very long time. It remained 20 years in this place, away from the tabernacle, away from daily use in the tabernacle. And in Shiloh, where the tabernacle was during all this time, there is a lamenting going on that we don't have our precious ark. Even though they know where it is, even though they had the ark, the appearance, the, the 
The idea is it's either unknown or more likely it's just no one has the guts to go get it. No one does get it until David finally claims this thing. So the people of Israel are determined to use the ark like a cultic object. They assume that they could receive God's blessings by putting the ark in front of them for battle, to which God replied, no, you can't. And instead of the blessing, they received his judgment. Now the arks come back again on God's grace, not for any reason of their own. And they still have this unhealthy fascination with it. Now, from a negative point of view, they hide it for 20 years, too afraid to touch it because they can't control its power. But then again, that's not the way you're supposed to use it in any case. Just keep God's word and let God do what he will. Right. And as a result of their second case of disobedience, he wipes out one of the cities, basically, of this corrupt priesthood. The point should be obvious to everyone at this point. He cares, the Lord cares about his covenant and about his people's obedience to the law of that covenant. And if you want to receive blessings from this Lord that you follow, then obey that covenant. It's just that simple. If you want to see the ark, then treat it as the law requires. Everything comes back to the word of God. Do what he says. See the result. Ignore what he says and do it your own way. See a different result. So with that recognition, we reach a turning point of sorts in this period of Judges when the people begin to listen to the word of the Lord. And briefly, we're going to look at chapter seven. It's it's, uh, relatively short and it's going to be one single message as a footnote to what's just happened with the ark. Starting in verses three through six. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord alone. Then Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzpah and I will pray for the Lord for you. They gathered to Mitzpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mitzpah. Now you see a change. Now you have Samuel back in the conversation. He has been largely absent from this narrative, going all the way back to the last time we heard him at the beginning of this episode, when we heard he was in Shiloh with the word of the Lord. Then he disappears and the word with him. And then nothing but terrible things happen at the end of it all. Once they felt the wrath of God in these different ways, they come back to him and he says, in effect, you ready to listen this time? And. Presumably they said yes, because then it says here he spoke to the people saying, here's the recipe you've been searching for. Instead of not listening to the word of God, he says, listen, return to him with all your heart, remove the idols, serve him alone, and you will see what you've been asking for from the Lord. That is the grace and mercy that you expect. And he will put an end to the torment of your enemies, that of the Philistines. But you've got to seek God on God's terms, not in superstition, not in ritual, but according to the covenant that he's already given you. And now, maybe because they're so shocked by their present circumstances, now they finally say, well, you know what? We've tried everything else. Let's try this. And they give what appears to be clear evidence of repentance. The people head down to a town near the Jordan River, and they begin this fast at Mitzpah. This is in the Jordan River Valley, getting near the Dead Sea. And we're not clear how many people are there, but it would appear to be a large number of the Israelites, for reasons that will come up here in a little while. While they're down there, you have Samuel praying for the for the people, for the deliverance from the uh, Philistines. They're fasting to the Lord and they're pouring out water, which is a, a Jewish washing ceremony, which you could roughly make equivalent to a baptism ceremony. This is the purification ceremony that is symbolic of washing away my guilt, washing away my sin, uh, not literally doing so, but symbolically doing so. This is a huge contrast to the prior episode, right before pridefully wielding the ark in battle attempting to control the Lord like any other idol. Now, setting aside those idols, turning to the Lord in a humble heart, approaching him through his prophet by his word. This is the 180 degree difference between seeking God in spirit and truth and seeking him in human terms. And look at the result. The next passage. Verse seven. Now, when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry to the Lord, our God, for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel and the Lord answered him. Now, Samuel was offering up the burnt offering and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. 
The men of Israel went out of Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzvah and Shen and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more within the border of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines, so there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. While they're down in this valley, imagine a group of people massed and focused on anything but war. It's unlikely they brought any war implements. They didn't bring their chariots, or if they had any, they certainly didn't bring their, their swords. They're just down there for an entirely different set of purposes. And it would seem as though the people of the Philistine cities heard that this was going on, and they noticed that the people of Israel are sitting ducks because you have them now sitting in this valley in which there's no easy way for them to get out and they're not prepared for battle. And the Philistines decide we'll ride up over the hills and down the other side and we'll have them trapped and we can wipe them out once for all. So this time, instead of them saying, let's go grab the ark, let's go find some way to defend ourselves. They turned to Samuel and said, pray to the Lord, let him save us from this huge change from their past in that respect. They make the right choice, so the Lord hears the prayer, and then we're told he answers the prayer, he agrees, he, he's going to do what's asked, and Samuel, in response, burns this offering of the whole lamb. This is all in keeping with someone who says, I can't, you can, by your will, not mine, take this and solve this problem. This is the first time in the story of Samuel that we have been told the Lord heard and answered his people. And then finally it comes time for battle and the Lord fights it entirely. Do you notice that? The people don't even have to raise a finger. There's no battle that takes place here. It's not as though the Israelites entered into battle and God made sure they won. God fought the whole battle for them. And then as the Philistines are retreating, then the people of Israel engage in the chase. Later they run them out of their cities. And all the time of Samuel's life, the people are free from the tyranny of the Philistines. And all this was made possible because they trusted in the word of the Lord. Which is exactly what Hannah said when she sung at Samuel's conception. And it's exactly what Zechariah says later in Zechariah 4, 6, which is, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for the reminder that uh, what we do, we do in your power, if it is to be of any value to you. When we seek it in our own power, Father, it's going to be frustrated. It's not going to please you. It's not going to honor you, and it can't hope to serve the purposes you have for it, Father, because you have said in your word, it will not be by our might or power that things will be done, but by your will alone and by your power alone. And, Father, it is intended that it would be so, so that you would get all the glory. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us a measure of power and ability that we can serve you in your spirit. We ask, Lord, that that would be the way we attend to our work this weekend and the events of the conference. And we ask that you would guide us. And you would inform our minds and hearts so that we speak according to your will. And you'd open our ears to hear things in a rich way. And you'd encourage our hearts to obey. Remembering the story of, of people who've gone before us and have made the mistakes we don't want to repeat. Help us remember that, Father. Thank you for the men and women who've come out tonight, Father, and will come out this weekend for the encouragement that it is to speak to a room with people who care for the same things we care about. And uh, let us all travel safely to and from these things. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.